Good morning, everybody. I hope you can hear me well. So I'd like to start by thanking the organizers for the invitation to come here, Professor Geinser, Jan Apche in particular, and uh, also the people who, who contributed to the work that I will discuss today. These are uh, students and postdocs in, in my group at ETH Zurich, and also we have collaborators from the Paul Scherer Institute, the group of uh, Lara Heidermann, and uh, Marta Rossell at EMPA, and then our collaborators at IMEC, Kevin Garello, Sebastian Cuen, and at the University of uh, Salamanca, Eduardo Martinez in particular. So um, we will change subject with respect to the first talk and, and discuss uh, the manipulation of spins by electric currents. And uh, so this is roughly uh, what we call spintronics or spin orbitronics nowadays. And um, sometimes I ask myself whether we are doing anything new in this field, right? And then when I listen to superconductivity talk, I'm kind of reassured because superconductivity has been around for more than 100 years. And I think we're still trying to understand it, still trying to improve it. So now, uh, if we look at certain concepts that are around in, in spintronics, right? One famous one is the domain wall racetrack memory, where information is encoded in magnetic domains, for example, up and down, as you see here. here. These domains can be injected and then shifted across a so-called racetrack, which is a stripe of a thin film magnetic material, and then detected at certain positions, right? Now, this idea is not new. In fact, it turns out that in the late 60s, it was already explored precisely in thin film uh, systems, although not so thin, where the main walls were nucleated inductively and then uh, shifted along uh, predetermined magnetic stripes on, on a thicker film by a combination of either um, inductive, um, so Ersted fields, or rotating magnetic fields. And also, if we look at skirmians, so skirmians are very fascinating uh, chiral spin objects where the magnetization swirls around with uh, well-defined uh, sense of rotation in, in, in different systems. So this uh, skirmians can also be moved, in particular by electric currents and spin orbit torques. They can be generated by uh, current injection can be detected by Hall effect, magnetic resistance, or optical uh, care effect. Now also here, this is uh, a concept that is quite similar to magnetic bubble memories that uh, some of us may, may remember from older times where uh, magnetization was encoded in this uh, cylindrical domains that span the whole thickness of a film. And these domains can then also be nucleated uh, inductively and shifted uh, across different locations of, of a magnetic layer with superimposed uh, electrical and magnetic elements on it. And uh, this type of memory is actually uh, were, were fabricated, commercialized. There are also personal computers that use this. Uh, I think the last one was in 1985. So, uh, and, and also, if we look at uh, magnetic random access memories as we think of them today, right, we have an array of magnetic tunnel junctions where information is encoded in the uh, alignment of the magnetization of the free layer relative to a reference layer. Now, this type of systems are also reminiscent of the uh, famous ferrite core memories that were the uh, most uh, used type of random access memories uh, for about 20 years. Here. And so here the, also the information was encoded in the magnetization of a toroidal ferrite core and it was written and read by uh, current, by electric current. Now this system is actually, uh, so there the were uh, practically 90% of random access memories in the 1970s, in the early 1970s were made using this system. This is the the uh, memory that went to the, to the moon with the Apollo system, and it survived in the space shuttle up to the 90s. 
because people were afraid of changing systems to, that would introduce errors. So are we really doing something new in this field, right? And uh, the answer is yes, right? So um, one point is that we're using different effects to read and write magnetization. And another more practical is that when we look at the performances of these memories, uh, we see that, that such a memory here, the, 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 the typical dimension of a magnetic bit is a millimeter in size. This is a picture taken with my phone of such a memory. Uh, and so to store 32 kilobits, you need a cubic feet of uh, this type of uh, arrays. Right? And uh, they, this memories could operate up to a megahertz clock cycle frequencies. They need a very large currents for being read and write of the order of an ampere. And so uh, if we compare to what we can do today with uh, magnetic tunnel junctions and, and integrated on, a, on CMOS circuits, then we see that uh, we are indeed doing much better in terms of integration density, scaling, uh, switching speed, and also the power that is re required to operate these memories. So uh, if we look at the uh, current architecture of, of a computer, right, where nowadays magnetic materials are basically uh, used for mass storage, so hard disk drives that, that store terabytes of data, it is indeed possible to replace some of these uh, higher level memories with, with magnetic uh, equivalents. Uh, the advantage being that uh, some of these, so all of these magnetic memories are non-volatile, which implies a saving power, uh, but also uh, some of these memories are more scalable, uh, for example, uh, relative to SRAM, for example. So, uh, there are advantages in, in uh, using spintronic memories, although there are also many challenges. So it, it is uh, right now too early to say whether uh, you know, this will happen on a massive scale. Right, so uh, what we are concerned with today is the, the fact that we can manipulate the magnetization using spin currents uh, and orbital currents, which are generated by charge currents. And so uh, this relationship between the, the, the uh, three different types of currents is actually very interesting also from a fundamental point of view. And then if we want to manipulate the magnetization, then uh, we'll see that there are spin textures that uh, are actually better suited to respond to current-induced spin torques than others. And so it is also important to understand this and see how they can be manipulated. So, um, the interaction between a spin polarized current in, in a magnetization is, is well known. We can think of uh, a current, an electric current with uh, uh, spin polarization, so a majority of spins polarize, polarize in one direction, entering into a ferromagnet, and this is equivalent to a flux of magnetization that enters into the, into the ferromagnet, and um, once this uh, spin current enters into the ferromagnet, then the um, the spin current can be absorbed, and uh, that will transfer to the local magnetization a uh, certain amount of angular momentum. And this gives rise to a, to a spin torque. Now the point is, how can we create a spin polarized current, right? And so uh, the most uh, used and, and uh, famous case is that of uh, polarizing an electric current by letting it flow through a magnetic layer where the uh, difference in spin conductivity between spin up and spin down electrons uh, polarizes or partially polarizes the current. And then if this current flows uh, through a non-magnetic spacer into a second uh, magnetic layer, it can transfer the spin polarization to the local magnetization of the second layer and this gives rise to the so-called spin transfer torque. And this is effectively a transfer of spin angular momentum from one layer to the other. Right? And uh, now the advantage of using this type of system is that at the same time that you can uh, manipulate the magnetization of this so-called free layer, you can also uh, read out the magnetic state because the parallel and anti-parallel alignment have uh, low and high resistance respectively. But 
uh, there are also alternative ways to, to generate spin polarized currents, and this have to do with uh, uh, spin orbit coupling, which promotes uh, the conversion of a charge into a spin current and vice versa. And there are essentially uh, two types of effects, those that uh, induce spin-dependent scattering, like the intrinsic and strength extrinsic spin hall effect, and those that induce a homogeneous spin rotation, like the Rushba-Edelstein effect. So the, the Rushba-Edelstein effect that we've also uh, briefly seen in the previous talk uh, occurs when we have electrons flowing at the interface of a material with uh, surface, in, with, uh, yeah, surface inversion symmetry, uh, asymmetry, sorry. And uh, in this case, uh, there is a, an electric field at the interface of the material generated, for example, by charge transfer between two dissimilar uh, elements. And uh, this electric field is then um, seen by, by the flowing electrons as a, as a magnetic field due to a Lorentz transformation that has uh, this um, V dot, uh, cross E orientation, so it's orthogonal to the current and to the electric field itself. Now this effective uh, Rushba field then uh, generates a spin polarization uh, along its direction. And so this leads to a homogeneous in-plane spin polarization. Spin hole effect is also well known. Uh, this occurs either due to uh, extrinsic effects of scattering by charge impurities, very similar to moth scattering, or to intrinsic band structure effects related to, uh, to barrier curvature, which acts as an effective magnetic field, spin-dependent magnetic field in, in, uh, um, in K space. And so electrons that are uh, flowing into a material with strong spin orbit coupling are deflected according to their spin direction towards opposite edges of the sample. In this case, it tries to uh, an accumulation, to, to, so to transverse spin currents and accumulation of spins at the interface of the conductor uh, that occurs on a length scale that is material dependent. This is the so-called spin diffusion length um, that, for example, in, in platinum is of the order of a few nanometers. Now, the, the parameter that we use to characterize this effect is the so-called spin all angle, which is the ratio between the spin current and the charge current in, in charge units. So it's an eight-dimensional quantity. And for platinum, we, we get numbers in the order of 10%, which means that we can convert a charge current into a spin current with an efficiency of about 10%. Now, these effects can be detected uh, directly. So uh, this is an experiment that we did some years ago where we had a, a very simple structure, so a platinum hole bar of, uh, say, 5 to, to 100 nanometer thick, and a scanning... Uh, magneto-optical care effect microscope where we focus the laser beam onto the surface of this uh, hole bar. We scan the laser beam across it as we uh, inject an AC current in this uh, hole bar. And what we see is that uh, apart from the optical reflectivity, we can measure the care rotation uh, during current injection. And uh, indeed, we observe a non-zero signal. This is a longitudinal MOC. Uh, tells us that we have spin accumulation uh, in the plane of the sample. And this signal scales with the, um, with the amplitude of the current as expected. So uh, now if we want to use these effects to manipulate the magnetization, what we usually do is to deposit a magnetic layer on top of a non-magnetic conductor where either a spin hole effect or Rushba-Edelstein effect are present, and uh, we exploit the fact that the spin accumulation at the interface of this material will eventually uh, diffuse into the magnetic layer and give rise to, to torques. And just by symmetry argument, we can distinguish between two uh, torques, two directions orthogonal to the magnetization, which we call uh, then the damping-like torque and the field-like torque um, that uh, act similar to, to magnetic damping or to a magnetic field. We can also consider the effective fields that are, correspond to these torques. 
So these effects can be used, uh, for example, to switch the magnetization of uh, a single ferromagnetic layer by injecting uh, current pulses into a, um, a planar structure like this. So we have, again, a platinum uh, hole cross here with a, with a cobalt dot, or just less than a nanometer thick perpendicular magnetization. And if we inject strong current pulses, we can reversibly switch the magnetization between up and down due to the action of this these torques. So this works quite well, and in fact, we can include these effects in magnetic tunnel junctions. Here you see um, uh, one that was fabricated at IMEC, uh, where we have a cobalt iron boron free layer, MGO tunnel barrier, cobalt iron boron reference layer, and a tungsten bottom electrode, where we can pass a current and generate by a spin all effect, we generate a spin off bit torque. And so uh, if we then look at, uh, we, we can then inject current pulses uh, in this structure and uh, observe the, the switching. Now the interesting thing about this type of devices is that uh, there are actually three terminals. So we have the bottom SOT electrodes for current injection, but we also have the top electrodes for readout to read the tunneling magnetic resistance, which can also be used to inject the current and therefore apply a spin transfer torque on, on the system. And uh, as we apply a voltage to the top electrode, we have a, a, um, another effect, which is uh, heating of the junction itself, and also uh, so-called voltage control of magnetic anisotropy, because by essentially electrically gating the free layer, we are changing the charge distribution and the magnetocrystalline anisotropy in this system. So all these effects can, can in fact be used to, to, uh, uh, together to improve the switching properties of these systems. Here you see an example of, of measurements done on such a, a device where we uh, first just uh, pulse the current through the top electrode, so this has been transfer torque switching, where you see that uh, the, these are single single shot time traces of the magnetization in the three layer. And that tells us that the, the switching times are quite random, in fact, right? But if we then uh, uh, switch from the spin transfer torque to spin orbit torque, we also get quite broad switching time distributions. But now if we start uh, applying the voltages and current in such a way that these different effects that I mentioned before um, combine together in, in a constructive way, we see that we are reducing strongly uh, the, uh, the distribution in, in switching times and also the, the time it takes for the magnetization to reverse. And we can indeed squeeze these times by a very substantial amount in this structure. Okay, so these are the, the switching distribution in terms of um, uh, so-called incubation time and uh, transition time. We will see later that we associate this uh, incubation time to the time it takes for the current to nucleate the domain and uh, this uh, reversal time to the time it takes for a domain to propagate across the structure. And so we can essentially switch if we crank up the currents and, and voltages in this system, we can switch in, in very small times, and we're essentially limited by, by the bandwidth of our measuring system here to, to go faster. Now, it's easy to understand spin orbit torque switching in a macro spin picture. This can be done both for perpendicular and in-plane magnetized systems. For perpendicular systems, one also needs, needs an in-plane magnetic field parallel to the current to break the symmetry of the uh, damping-like spin orbit torque. But essentially, these are well understood uh, mechanisms. However, it turns out that uh, macro spin switching is not what uh, we observe in general. Right? We, we need very small uh, magnetic systems to, to uh, preserve uh, macro spin behavior. So, in general, we have to deal with uh, nucleation propagation of the main walls, and here is where the spin textures become important. Now, in thin films, we have generally uh, two types of, of domain walls, bloch or nail, depending on whether the magnetization uh, uh, rotates in a helical way or in a cycloidal way. 
And in perpendicular magnetized thin films, the block wall are generally favored by magnetostatic considerations. However, if we consider uh, how uh, a spin current X on the magnetization of the domain walls, we have two substantial differences. Right. So uh, in the case of block wall, the injected spin current is parallel to the magnetization in the domain wall. And in this case, the torque is zero. Okay. On the contrary, in the nail wall, we have a situation where the injected spin current is orthogonal to the magnetization in the wall, and in this case, the torque is maximum. So clearly, uh, for spin orbit torques to act on the main walls, the nail configuration is the most favored one. And uh, now this is uh, kind of fortunate because it turns out that in magnetic systems coupled to uh, uh, non-magnetic conductors where you have strong spin orbit coupling and, and also uh, surface um, structure inversion symmetry, um, the nail walls are, are the favored ones. And uh, you can see that uh, now if we uh, visualize the torque as an effective field, then the effective field in these walls has a, the direction of an easy axis. And so for example, this field here will tend to expand this domain and this field here will tend to expand this other domain here. And so it's a very effective uh, mechanism for, for moving domain walls. Right. So as I said, uh, then in this type of systems, the, um, naturally we have the formation of nail walls because uh, we have also, uh, because of spin orbit coupling and structure inversion symmetry, we have also an interfacial chalusinski mori interaction uh, which is mediated by the atoms in the non-magnetic layer that favors non-collinear al alignment of the uh, spins in the domain wall. And not only that, it also uh, induces a, a well-defined chir chirality in the walls, so a, a rotation of the spin cycloid here. This was actually observed uh, first by spin-polarized STM in the, in the group of uh, Wiesendanger in Hamburg, where um, by looking at the magnetic configuration of two monolayers of iron on tungsten with perpendicular magnetization, as you see here, these are uh, the main alternate domains of up and down magnetization. By changing the, the coating of the magnetic tip to in plane, it was observed that at the domain wall position, the magnetization actually alternates. And this is a signature of chiral, of chirality, which was uh, understood a few years later when it was finally recognized that the uh, interfacial, interfacial DMI plays a very uh, strong role in determining the, the spin texture of, of thin films. And this you see here, for example, in this uh, uh, spin spiral configuration of a monolayer on, on tungsten. Okay, so, so how does it work in practice? This is a, a, a micromagnetic simulation of current-induced propagation of a domain wall in, uh, with parameters that correspond to cobalt platinum. And so we have this nail wall configuration. We have a damping-like torque, uh, and then uh, this torque is equivalent to a, a, an out-of-plane field that will expand this domain. And so uh, then if I start the simulation, this leads to a propagation as well as a tilt which is the result of the combination of the torque and chalusinski mori interaction. And this tilt also leads to a, um, asymmetric uh, domain wall propagation velocity. It's important to explain also the uh, skirmian hole effects in these systems. So uh, can we see uh, how important are these effects in a, in a real system? Uh, so here we made an, exper an experiment where we have a, a a cobalt dot about a nanometer thick uh, deposited onto a platinum uh, current line and, and the whole thing is deposited on a semi-transparent silicon nitride membrane. So you see this is the platinum current line, this is the cobalt dot, and we mount this onto a, a, a PCB uh, uh, sample holder. And uh, we then use uh, 
so-called scanning transmission X-ray microscopy at the uh, Swiss light source to image the magnetization in time and space. And what we do, we focus an X-ray beam uh, with a spot size of about 25 nanometers onto a, our sample. We scan the X-ray beam and we measure the transmitted X-ray intensity. Uh, tuning the X-ray energy at the cobalt absorption edge, which gives us, at the same time, elemental and magnetic resolution. And as you see here, these are uh, XMCD, uh, so X-ray magnetic circular diagrams, contrast maps of uh, this dot for up and down magnetization. So, uh, and then we do a, a current pump X-ray probe, uh, stroboscopic experiment. And so what you see here, this is the, um, these are the, the current pulses in, in red, and this is the trace of the, so this is the integrated XMCD contrast as a function of time. And uh, if we look at the switching events here, let's see if the movie work. Okay. You'll see that in time we have uh, first nucleation of a domain and then the propagation of, of the domain walls and uh, this nucleation and propagation events, they follow a very peculiar pattern, which you see schematized here. It tells us that uh, the nucleation as well as the propagation direction of the domain walls are specific to the combination of current and in-plane fields that we use to control these systems. And this, uh, which you see then uh, summarized here, is very specific to, to spin-orbit torque-induced domain wall motion. Uh, uh, where we have, in fact, first the nucleation of uh, domain wall on the side where the magnetization tilts due to cholesinski mori interaction, external field, and uh, torques, both uh, field-like and damping-like spin orbit torques. And then the propagation of the domain walls follows a, a diagonal uh, pattern. That's the direction where the propagation is faster. And the fact that we can measure this in a stroboscopic way t tells us that this is a very reproducible uh, switching dynamics. And in fact, we, we find it not only in ferromagnetic systems, but also in ferromagnetic systems. Now here, things are uh, uh, even more interesting because we have two magnetic sublattices that are antiferromagnetically coupled. So the transition metal sublattice and the rare earth sublattice. And so they form a system with a partially compensated magnetization. You actually also have a compensation temperature where the magnetization is exactly compensated. And they're very interesting because um, uh, they, they display very fast field or current-induced dynamics, particularly at the angular momentum compensation point. This has been shown, for example, in the groups of uh, Jeff Beach or um, Yun Sung Yang in, in, in Singapore. Um, they uh, have a tunable perpendicular magnetic anisotropy, they have DMI, they have low stray field, etc. Now, if we repeat the type of experiments that we've done with, uh, with uh, scanning transmission X-ray microscopy with a, a, a dot that is uh, cobalt gadolinium iron in composition, and we record the traces of the magnetization in an element resolved way, this is for iron and this is for gadolinium, this is the current pulse, we see that uh, the two magnetization do not switch at the same time. There is actually a transient region of the order of two nanoseconds where we have ferromagnetic alignment of the two on average. So this is very unusual. It was also very much unexpected to observe this de decoupling, uh, which uh, people tend normally tend to assume that uh, the magnetization during current-induced reversal in these systems, they're always rigidly antiferromagnetic with respect to each other. And if we look at the especially resolved maps, we see that uh, whereas iron switches as uh, we've seen for cobalt, so uh, nucleation of a, of a reverse domain on one side and then propagation of a domain wall, gadolinium uh, doesn't seem to, to switch at all first, and then it uh, sort of uh, uh, loses contrast, right? And then after several nanoseconds, it recovers a uh, magnetization that is anti-parallel to iron. So that's surprising enough, but uh, even more surprising is that if we look at uh, different sets of uh, dots uh, with similar composition, we observe a different dynamics. Now, 
uh, the dynamics is faster, uh, and we, we have domain world propagation in both systems, but the domain in Kadlim is actually delayed with respect to iron. And we have also a third case where the dynamics is even faster, but now fully synchronized. So uh, it took us, uh, I think, about two years in, in measuring uh, six, six beam times to understand what was going on. And uh, so here are some conclusions. First of all, um, we, we have these three different cases, right? And then um, if we want to describe a decoupling of the magnetization, we have to take into account two things. One is that the spin orbit torques, which means the absorption of a spin current from the platinum underlayer into the uh, ferrimagnetic layer, uh, is not the same for the iron and gadolinium sublattices. It has to be faster for iron than for gadolinium, leading to a master slave type of dynamics. Um, and the second one is that if the two sublattices decouple, that means that the antiferromagnetic exchange cannot be so strong. And the fact that we saw that this coupling can vary from sample to sample means that it's actually a variable in our study. So uh, after many experiments and tests, and we measure more than 20 samples at, in different beam times, uh, we came to the conclusions that the microstructure of the alloy plays a very important role here. So it's not really the, the detail of the stoichiometric composition, but is the uh, the way the atoms are intermixed in the ferrimagnet that determines this different dynamics. And so as we grow the sample by uh, sputter deposition, uh, we have, and this we have seen by, by uh, E-beam diffraction and TM studies, uh, we have clustering on a scale of a few nanometers of rare earths and, and transition metals. And this effectively reduces the antiferromagnetic exchange between the two lattices because you have clusters of rare earths, clusters of transition metals, and so they interact only through the surfaces of this cluster. But uh, since the mixing enthalpy of the, these different elements is negative, over time we get aging, and aging goes with a better mixing of the two species, and this leads to a faster dynamic. And so uh, then we, we think this is what explains the, the dynamics in the system. How much time do I have still? 12 minutes. Okay. Good. So uh, now in all these systems, the domain walls are, are nail type or, or partially nail type. And uh, this also extends to ferrimagnetic garnet. This, this is, oh, sorry. Uh, this is another example where we, we study current-induced domain wall motion uh, due to current injection in platinum, but now we have as a uh, magnetic layer a, an insulating ferrimagnet, it's tulium iron garnet, um, and here again we can uh, move domain walls. We can also probe the nature of these domain walls by scanning NV magnetometry, which measures the stray field profile over a wall, and by fitting it, since Bloch and Nell wall have different stray fields, we can actually characterize the walls in this system. And this work was uh, presented by Saul uh, Veles a few days ago, so I will not uh, spend uh, a lot of time on this. Uh, Saul also presented a uh, study of current induced skirmium motion uh, in, in, again, tulium iron garnet uh, platinum where we see that we can induce the formation of schemions by current pulses, propagate them again by spin orbit torques, and uh, we observe a schemion hole effect. And uh, this is again consistent with the fact that we have uh, nail wall uh, surrounding the, the, the schemion core. core. Okay. And what Sal also uh, measured is that the motion of these systems is uh, uh, strongly affected by pinning so although in, in the images that we present, the schemas appear to move in a sort of flow-like way, uh, the motion is, is really much more uh, hopping-like. Good, so in, in the last 10 minutes, then I uh, want to discuss a, a related topic, 
which is since uh, we've seen that uh, chiral spin textures are so important in determining the efficiency with which this uh, um, uh, the, the magnetic domains moves and skirmion moves, what can we do to uh, engineer the uh, spin texture? Okay. So there are several ways of doing this, uh, for example, by changing the, the substrate over layer materials by electrical gating, and, and here I will present a, in a different way. Um, so generally, whenever we have interactions between magnets, we can then uh, exploit them to couple different parts of a system. Right? This is true for dipolar coupling, it's true for exchange, and we have two famous examples that are used in, in magnetic devices. Exchange bias, so uh, coupling a ferromagnetic layer to an antiferromagnet by uh, exchange at the interface, this leads to the stabilization of the magnetization in this system, uh, or coupling through a non-magnetic spacer by um, the conduction electrons in the spacers, and this is called the RKKY coupling. And both these interactions are used to stabilize the magnetization in uh, magnetic tunnel junctions that are actually used in, in, in MRAPs. Now, we can also uh, think of doing something similar with the uh, Jaruzinski moria interactions uh, and couple layers in different ways. For example, it is possible to couple uh, now two uh, ferromagnetic layers uh, in a way that is uh, unusual, so orthogon with orthogonal magnetization because the DMI promotes this uh, non-collinear coupling of the magnetization. And this is work that, for example, uh, Jan did a few years ago. He showed this beautifully in, in cobalt, cobalt, terbium um, layers separated by the platinum spacers. And, and this is, uh, leads to this interlayer coupling. Uh, now, in the remaining time, I will focus on uh, a coupling induced by the DMI, but for planar structures. And the idea here is that, again, if we start from this picture of nail walls induced by, by DMI at the interface between to, uh, to uh, a magnetic material and a heavy metal, then uh, if we have a way of changing the magnetic anisotropy of part of the magnetic layer from out of plane to in plane, we can realize planar structures that have this orthogonal coupling mediated by uh, half a nail wall, in fact. And this works in practice. So uh, what we can do, for example, if we start from cobalt platinum, we can partially oxidize only a, a certain region of the layer. So here you see this is a uh, oxidized cobalt, top cobalt interface. This is not oxidized because it's protected by a, an aluminum uh, layer with a tantalum mask on, on top of it. And so uh, the non-oxidized region has in-plane magnetization, the oxidized region has out-of-plane magnetization. This is also seen by, by polar MOC. And if we then uh, study the, the coupling of the magnetization in this, in this system, by uh, this was done by X-ray autoemission electron microscopy, again at, at the Swiss light source, we see that whenever, uh, so here we have uh, small islands patterned on platinum where we have uh, a region that is magnetized out of plane, the red one, and a region that is magnetized in plane where this is not oxidized. Right? And what we notice is that there is a, a, a correlation between the out of plane magnetization and in plane one, which is exactly what we would expect for the nail uh, walls and for chiral or the chiral domain walls in this system. Okay. And in fact, if we measure the magnetization of the out-of-plane region as a function of applied field uh, using the whole effect uh, for different orientations of the in-plane region, so either, say, left or right, we see that uh, the switching of the out-of-plane part is actually, the, the switching field is determined by the direction of the magnetization in the in-plane region. So this is a kind of lateral exchange bias uh, induced by this DMI coupling of the interface. Okay. And we can also use this coupling to induce 
um, field-free spin orbit torque switching of the outer plane region in the same structure. Now, it's very interesting to realize couple structures in the plane. So uh, here we can uh, connect two out-of-plane regions by an in-plane spacer, and this leads to effectively antiferromagnetic coupling between the two out-of-plane regions. And we can see that uh, depending on the length of the in-plane spacer, uh, switching one region, which we make larger than the other one, can lead to the reversal of the other out-of-plane region. So these are uh, sort of synthetic antiferromagnets in 2D. We can also make, using the same principle, synthetic skirmions and, and skirmioniums, so where you have more than one winding of the magnetization here. Uh, and, and so here we have different uh, concentric regions that are antiferromagnetically coupled by in-plane spacers. Okay. Of course, these are static objects and they, they don't move because they are uh, fixed by lithography on the system. So we can use this uh, uh, in-plane DMI coupling to uh, uh, engineer different effects, so lateral exchange bias, synthetic antiferromagnets, we can pattern artificial spin ices and skirmions, we can induce field-free switching, and we can also uh, inject domain walls using such lateral interfaces. And last, this is the, the last point I, I, I would like to show, is that in, we can modify the magnetization in, in, in domain wall racetracks to perform operations on domain walls. So uh, consider such a, uh, a magnetic stripe where we have uh, patterned an in-plane region uh, inside. So uh, inside a, an out-of-plane magnetized track. Okay. Now we inject a current in this structure. We have a domain wall propagating, approaching the in-plane region. Okay. And so what happens is, in this case is that the approaching domain wall is annihilated on one side of the in-plane uh, region. It flips the magnetization of the in-plane region because of uh, magnetostatic and spin orbit uh, interactions and leads to the emergence sorry. yeah it leads to the emergence of a domain wall on the other side of the in-plane regions but now this domain wall has opposite polarity so here we have up down here we have down up this is actually verified in practice okay this is uh, measured by by again by Stixim here different uh, times this domain wall here arrives, it's annihilated, and it emerges on the opposite side with opposite polarity. So I'll be a bit faster here. So using this effect, we can uh, essentially realize a knot operation on the main walls. So uh, inverting the polarity of, of a train of the main walls, for example, we can cascade uh, different gates. We can also realize majority logic gates, so where we have a uh, more than one racetrack uh, converging in a single uh, single region. In this region, we have a thin in-plane spacer that couples antiferromagnetically the magnetization on, on each side here. And so depending, so the coupling is always antiferromagnetic, but now depending on how many uh, sides of the racetracks are magnetized up or down, the, uh, the, the, uh, say the bottom part will couple, will either be up or, or down, right? And uh, we can then realize different types of structures where depending on the number of, on the um, uh, magnetization direction in the inputs, we have uh, different types of outputs. Here this is a, an end type of gate, this is a north type of gate, and the difference between the two is that we have this third terminal which we call the bias terminal that determines uh, which of the output will, will uh, uh, eventually uh, be the lowest energy configuration. Okay, so I think my time is basically uh, up. Um, 
I just mentioned that we can realize uh, more complex structures by cascading different gates, exploiting the fact that the main walls can cross, they can fan out. So we have this type of operations. And so this uh, is very interesting for the future. And uh, just to mention a challenge, uh, all these things work very nicely, but if we, were, if we want to improve on this, we need materials where this uh, spin orbit torque efficiency, which is practically a, a spin all angle, uh, has to increase, right? And uh, uh, this is a, not only it has to be large, but it, it has to be large in materials with a low resistivity because the power required to move the main walls or switch uh, is actually proportional to current square time times resistivity. So, and here we see these are heavy metals, these are topological insulators, and ideally we would like to fill this corner rather than, than this one. Okay, so I'll skip that and I'll thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, Pietro, for this comprehensive talk. So, questions? can ask one. Uh. Ah, yeah, Lanza. Hello, thank you, uh, Pietro. Very nice talk. I'm not very objective, but I found fascinating spin drawing. Um, you skip all the last slides about uh, orbital Q and generation. Can you just say a few words? What are the challenges and the opportunities of this new, let's mm -hmm. say, effect? Thank you. Yeah, sure. So, um, so the orbital hole effect uh, has been mentioned also in, in, in talks yesterday. Um, it, it's a very interesting phenomenon by which uh, an electric current leads to the accumulation of electrons with uh, uh, opposite orbital momentum at opposite sides of a sample. And it is also believed to be an effect that uh, comes before the spin hole effect. So you can have orbital accumulation uh, if you have a material that has so-called orbital textures, that means that the orbital character of the wave functions varies with momentum, uh, but without spin orbit coupling. And then if you add spin orbit coupling, then this leads to a coupling of orbitals and spins. It can also lead to a spin hole effect. So this effect was predicted actually in 2005 by Bernevig and colleagues, and then was uh, taken uh, over again by uh, Contani and colleagues for, for transition metals. It was forgotten for a long time until uh, Hugh Wan Lee and colleagues in Korea uh, calculated, and uh, again, these effects in, in transition metals and showed that the uh, orbital hole conductivity in certain light metal systems can actually be larger than that uh, expected for the spin hole conductivity in heavy metal systems. And so now uh, experiments are coming out and, and they're quite uh, interesting. Now, what I can comment on uh, here is, is uh, recent work that we did in our group, but this doesn't work anymore. So. Can you move on one slide? Okay. So, uh, you, you can essentially do similar experiments where you inject a current into a, uh, this time it's a light metal, so for example, chromium, titanium, uh, and observe the torques, measure the torques on an adjacent magnetic layer. And if you do that, you measure certain torque efficiencies, which we can translate into uh, whole conductivities, uh, that are uh, already quite large. So for cobalt, uh, cobalt chromium, Right. we are about half of the value relative to cobalt platinum. Okay, so that shows that these materials are indeed much more efficient than what was initially thought. There's also a change of sign of the torques when changing the ferromagnetic material, which is not expected at all for, for a, a spin hole effect. So that's a signature of the hole effect, of the orbital hole effect. But now what is I find very interesting is that if you now insert a 
spacer layer in between the material that generates the orbital current and the ferromagnet. This uh, orbital torque can be increased by a significant amount. In our case, by uh, something like a factor four if we insert terbium in between chromium and, and cobalt. And the reason for that, we think, is that uh, these uh, rare earth layers, these poor F layers, have a very strong spin orbit coupling, but by themselves, they don't generate a very strong uh, spin hole effects or, or orbital hole effects. And so they act as uh, converters of an orbital current into a spin current. Right? And eventually, if you want to torque the magnetization, you need a spin current. And so, uh, in this case, this, this works very, very well. You see these are the efficiencies that we measure that are uh, larger than cobalt platinum. So I think there is a, uh, you know, quite some room to play there with this combination of materials where you can actually exploit uh, spin and orbital current together. And if you get the right conversion, then this can lead to uh, you know, a strong effects. So we are well over time, so uh, let's thank Pietro again. Thank you.